right, so back again in these crazy times. So firstly, everyone obviously stay safe. And I'd like to note that I choose which books I'm going to do pretty far in advance. So this, I'm not doing this just because of the time. Uh, that is Foucault's The Birth of the Clinic. But it is very relevant to today. Um, but yeah, so obviously stay safe. Uh, stay indoors if you can. Don't interact with people so on and so forth. Uh, and also I'd like to thank James, Matt, Nicholas, and uh, Sebastian, who have been immeasurably helpful in keeping this going. Now, for anyone else that'd be willing to contribute, um, obviously in these times, take care of yourself first, uh, but my patron is there. Also, you can find this in podcast form on Podbean, unless you're already listening to it from there, then I don't know why I'm mentioning it. Uh, Instagram, theory underscore and underscore philosophy. And that is about it. So without further ado, I won't waste more time. Let's jump right into this. So the birth of the clinic, a pretty important text in Foucault's, you know, corpus of his eight or nine books or so. So in the introduction, oh, okay. So one more thing, actually. This is going to be a two-part thing. I'm going to cover the first half here, and I'm also going to put timestamps for each of the chapters. So if, you know, you just want to listen to one thing, you could probably easily find it with the timestamp. Okay, now, so we start with the introduction here. Uh, he says in the introduction, these are his words, that this book is about space, about language, and about death. Semicolon, it is about the act of seeing, the gaze. So that semicolon is interesting. Because it's not a book that is about space, language, death, about seeing and the gaze. It is almost as though seeing and the gaze, being separated from the other things with that semicolon, are actually part of those other things. As though we could, th it's impossible for us to think about space, language, or death without thinking about seeing and without thinking about the gaze. So these are two very important ideas, or this act of seeing and the gaze that you know we're going to see a lot of in this text and that'll come out with much more clarity as we go on now upon setting out this very broad kind of summary of what this book is about he lays out two different medical practices that were separated by about a year or a year sorry a hundred years so he describes the first one and this was by someone named pom p-o-m-m-e in france obviously where he describes a doctor who in the mid-18th century prescribed a hysteric take 10 to 12 hour long baths for 10 months. So this patient began shedding membrane, membranous tissue from the inside, you know, as a result. So that seems like a pretty wacky thing to us. Now, let's uh, flash forward 100 years to another doctor named uh, Bale, B-A-Y-L-E in case anyone cared. So 100 years later, another doctor said this, about a patient with chronic meningitis. And I want to read a little section here. So this is about uh, chronic meningitis. So this doctor wrote, The false membranes are often transparent, especially when they are very thin, but usually they are white, gray, or red in color, and occasionally yellow, brown, or black. This matter often displays different shades in different parts of the same membrane. The thickness of these accidental productions varies greatly. Sometimes they are so tenuous that they might be compared to a spider's web. So the organization of the false membranes also displays a great many differences. So between these two perspectives, there is a kind of focus on the, the manifestation of these, these membranous tissues. So Foucault says that in the 100-year period between, I guess, somewhere in the 1700s, mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, Foucault says that we can see very vast differences between these two doctors and very minuscule differences where both of them describe the same thing that is appealing of the skin as a bodily defense mechanism against uh, in, the, in the case of the second at least meningitis and they're both describing the necessity for a kind of peeling to go on a kind of uh, a necessity for a shedding of, of skin to some extent but he says that the former that is the one who w was prescribing someone take these long baths, was not recognized in the same kind of medico-scientific vocabulary, the kind of same medico-scientific paradigm as the latter. And then we can compare it to today, 
by our standards, these people just completely don't belong to the medical practice at all, right? They are, you know, charlatans or uh, superstitious, naive people dealing with the humors or, or black bile or something, which all Foucault will come to unpack. So it's important to note that this book is in many ways a sequel to Madness and Civilization, one of his, one of his first ones, kind of his first one, really, where in that book, Foucault highlights that the methods by which people engaged in the act of healing, that is, they tried to heal people with mental illness, many of these practices came from archaic ones. And I use that term in, in as nice a way as I can. They just come from older, arcane practices. So while it might have appeared that the medical intervention in mental illness was a triumph of like the developments in science, Foucault traces and he just says, like he just presents the historical facts that say, not quite. In fact, what happened was, is we saw an extension of very arcane practices, but they were just kind of adopted in a new kind of accepted way under the veneer, under the umbrella of scientific validity. So that is in many ways what we're seeing here. But Foucault is going to go into much more detail about the emergence of, as the title suggests, the clinic itself. Now, if we return for a second to the two differences between these two doctors, the differences between these two doctors, what we find in the second one, if you can recall, if not, you can go back, um, is a very precise description, one that gives a kind of life to what exists beneath the surface or what exists on the body, where it's almost like in the first example, that is with Pum, the person writing in about the mid 1700s, was describing like a, a kind of strange, mysterious phenomenon occurring. Now, in the latter, that is with Bale, what we see is not a, a total illumination of what's going on, but a more precise description of what's going on. And that's very clear in the, um, the quote I read. Now, Foucault says that what this kind of brings about is the emergence of a, of a rhetoric around precision, which in itself doesn't really point to progress. It is just another way of describing the same thing. So in Foucault's words, all that has really changed is the silent configuration in which language finds support, which is the relation of situation and attitude to what is speaking and what is spoken about. And then he asks, do Bale's white and red membranes possess greater value, solidity, and objectivity in terms of scientific discourse than the horny scales described by doctors of the mid-1700s? So he kind of characterizes the shift as follows, where he kind of says that prior to a medico-scientific apparatus or institution, what was seen and what was said were connected. So if someone saw that um, a hysterical person was acting hysterically, it doesn't seem totally outlandish for them to think that they should bathe them in cold water to calm them down. So there was a connection there between what was seen and kind of what was prescribed. Now, in the medical scientific episteme, or in that kind of institution, what is said, or that is the knowledge around it, um, which is knowledge accumulated by a meticulous gaze, is relatively indifferent to what is seen and what is felt. So there's more of a detachment from the person experiencing the, the symptoms, experiencing the pain, and there's more of a desire to tell the person what is wrong with them. Now, in this, th throughout the course of this book, we're going to find like moments where that kind of changes. But for now, it's just a good kind of starting point to think about how this logic changed. And that will come out because we'll actually find that there's going to be an, an even more precise connection between what is seen and what is prescribed or what is, what is um, kind of told about it or what is said later on. But that we'll get to that. But for now, let's consider two other scientific kind of endeavors to uncover the secrets of the body. So he says that there was, in the mid-1700s, there was a guy named Meckel, J.F. Meckel, uh, who used the rational method of weighing equal volumes and comparing them to determine which parts of the brain had been dehydrated, which parts had been swollen, and by which diseases. So that 
seems like a pretty legitimate way to conduct, um, I guess, science in, in a kind of medical uh, scenario. This was like a quantifiable way of looking at disease. And this was happening in the mid 1700s, a time when, you know, medicine was seen as being fairly archaic. Now he compares that to, I guess, a quote unquote, modern approach by uh, a guy named Bichat, 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 anyways, who used the celebrated hammer with a broad, thin end. If one proceeds with light taps, no concussion liable to cause disorders can result as the skull is full. So the fruit is opened up. From under this meticulously parted shell, a soft grayish mass appears. Now these two different approaches kind of reverse the way we might think about the progression of the kind of scientific approaches to medicine. Because it seems like the former, the one that, you know, takes the brain, measures it, is much more sophisticated than the beating of the brain with a hammer or breaking through the skull so as to see if a concussion will ensue in order to reveal like the grayish mysterious mass. So what what happened here? Why is it that the latter approach was the one that was taken as being superior? Well, Foucault says that it is taken as being superior because it places more an emphasis on the act of seeing and that is what is important. And Foucault is going to trace that throughout this book to find out what it is about the kind of powerful gaze that is the legitimating force, the doctor. What is it about their eyes that gives a kind of justification to their existence and that in many ways maintains an idea about illness among the sick? It, it kind of keeps people sick to some extent, but we'll, we'll get into that. And what this does, and for those somewhat familiar with kind of Foucauldian um, lexicon or Foucauldian language, what we see is the establishment of a kind of subjectivity here, where the person being seen becomes a subject to um, an observing doctor. So this, in Foucault's words, establishes the individual in his irreducible quality. And so then this interaction between a doctor and a patient become a kind of moment of kind of it transcends discourse it becomes purely a sight of sight it, it becomes a sight of a doctor seeing and a doctor through the act of seeing knowing now this is to kind of reiterate what i've already just said here this is in distinction to kind of a quantifiable approach one that would measure the brain for instance which again seems totally strange to us probably because we're like well no that would be the proper way to do science and in many ways foucault is like there is a right way to do science, but something happened in our kind of cultural imagination that made it so that people would just think looking, think the kind of powerful gaze assumed of doctors was enough. So in terms of the kind of practical change that we saw, or that we're going to kind of unfold, Foucault characterizes it as follows. Where prior to the emergence of the clinic, the way that the doctor would engage with the patient would be through asking, what is the matter with you? So that was opening up a dialogue. What happened in the age of the clinic was a transformation of that to the question, where does it hurt? Because then it becomes a matter of the patient just, just saying where it hurts and then the doctor taking over from there. So this would kind of move us beyond the stubborn subjectivity that was implicit in patients. Now, anyone kind of within the medical field, knows that there's a problem of subjectivity. No two patients, even with the exact same illness, will describe them in the same way. And that presents a problem. And in many ways, the early forms of the clinic were already trying to find ways around that by limiting the amount of speaking that the you know patient would be doing. So it would just become a matter of the doctor getting right to the truth of the disease, right to the truth of the symptom. And then he qualifies at the end of the introduction here in a very Foucauldian way that he doesn't want to hierarchize one form of medical practice over another. He doesn't want to say one is superior to another. He's just, and this is what I love about him, he's just doing a history of it. He's looking at what happened historically that put us in this situation. And he sprinkles philosophy in there, of course, which is so interesting. Now, I should say that not all historians really like Foucault. 
because he does cherry pick. But, you know, we'll leave that for another day. So that pushes us here into the first chapter titled Spaces and Classes. So for us today, and in the kind of established domain of the clinic, the body was the site of disease. So disease didn't, doesn't really exist on its own in, in the doctor-patient encounter. The disease is just what affects the body. And it, becomes a, it, it is a matter of correcting that so that the body can return to normal. So there was a kind of indifference to the disease itself. Now that wasn't always the case, according to Foucault. He said prior to this, prior to the location of disease and illness in the body, diseases were classified and taxonomized, taxonomized is just kind of another word to classify, uh, as their own separate things. So diseases were, you know, organisms. This was what was called classificatory medicine, that is the medicine of classification. Now this also will assume another name that is uh, kind of nosological medicine, the, the medicine of kind of characterizing disease, locating them in, 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 in organization, into families, into genera, into species, so that they could be compared, connected, you know, traced. Uh, diseases can be um, kind of, uh, you can perform genealogies of disease, you know, so on. Now, here we go with the first of many Foucauldian lists. So for anyone familiar with Foucault, in all of his books, he loves to do lists, which is, you know, a blessing and a curse for the reader because it makes things easy to grasp and, and, and kind of understand. But at the same time, it makes it hard to remember all the specific details of each. So he classifies this classificatory medicine, it's kind of funny, into four principles. So number one. Classificatory medicine appreciates historical over philosophical knowledge. So what does that mean? Historical knowledge looks at immediate symptoms like fever or coughing, for example. Philosophical knowledge calls into, uh, calls into question the origin, the principle, the cause of the disease. So if I can put it in my own kind of layman terms, uh, historical knowledge is kind of concerned primarily with what is seen. And then that thing that is seen might be tr tried to, uh, we might try to classify it. Whereas the philosophical approach is, can be removed from what is seen in order to philosophize, to theorize about the origins of this thing, to find the history, ironically, of the disease, to kind of get at the truth of the disease, you know, through reason, through the mind. So cl the classificatory mode is concerned with the historical knowledge, not philosophical knowledge. So that's the first principle. Second principle, diseases are compared based off of um, their similarities. So for example, and this is on page five, within this great kinship, minor divergences are established. Apoplexy, apoplexy sorry, robs one of the use of all the senses and all the voluntary motility, but it spares the breathing and the functioning of the heart. Paralysis affects only a locally assignable sector of the nervous system and motility. Like apoplexy, syncope has the general effect, but it, is, it also interrupts respiratory movements. The perspective distribution, which enables us to see in paralysis a symptom, in syncope an episode, and in apoplexy an organic and functional attack, does not exist for the classificatory gaze, which is sensitive only to surface divisions, in which vicinity is not defined by measurable distances, but by formal similarities. So the differences don't concern the classificatory gaze, it's, it's what the similarities are what draw it in, right? Because that's how you make tables and, and draw connections and, and, and charts and, and whatnot. Okay, so now third principle of classificatory medicine. So by relying on surface appearance, and similarity, as we've just established, Foucault suggests that doctors would see in diseases an extension of the natural order. So this reveals, in his words, the rational order of the diseases. So just by looking at how they manifest themselves, there's the belief then that what we are getting is the kind of truth of the thing. And because at this time in our, in our history, there was an implicit association between truth and nature, that is what was seen as natural is Con was considered true, and the human is like the thing that moves beyond it. Think of the Enlightenment here. Uh, the human is what goes beyond nature. 
What we see then is a kind of association between the disease and what is true. Now, of course, anyone with kind of critical lens right now might say, well, does the idea of nature exist? Like, doesn't the idea of nature only emerge once we place it in kind of distinction to a thing that is not nature, that is civilization, that is, you know, human organization or, or anything like that? I'm rambling. Anyways, so that's the third principle. The fourth one, the final one, in this way, we are dealing with diseases naturally and ideally, that is kind of in their own terms. As such, the traits of the patient should be bracketed off. So it is not that the disease is counter nature, the patient is. So same with the doctor too, if they aren't con committed to classificatory medicine. So what the hell does that mean? Well, now that we've established that the disease is a kind of representation of nature, and we've already established in the, in the introduction that there's a problem when it comes down to the subjectivity of the patient. That is, the patient might obscure the truth of the disease with their own stubborn subjectivity, their own stubborn interpretation of it. It becomes a matter of the doctor getting at the absolute truth of the disease. And they do that by just kind of taking it as it is. So this is a paradox. This presents a paradox because at this time, medicine was still concerned with healing a patient. But it sought to do this by getting at the truth of, of disease that demanded a kind of effacement, demanded a kind of erasure of the patient themselves and even the doctor. So it became a matter of like a, like a true kind of objective, non-subjective gaze looking at the same kind of thing in a patient that erased both of those identity markers. And even more ironically, under this classificatory medicine, there is the belief that disease is organic to some extent, that is, it grows and develops. So it's almost like this gaze wants the disease to intensify, wants it to expand in order to get the most true form of the disease itself in its kind of heightened uh, evolution. But anyone familiar with disease would know that it changes. Like different people have different symptoms to the same disease. And diseases you know, in the, because they manifest themselves on the body, the way that they manifest themselves changes even within, you know, the same body over time. So this nosological, this, this classificatory medis, medicinal gaze has to be prepared to accommodate these kinds of changes. So what Foucault says is that, is that this demands a, a transformation from a kind of mathematical approach because that's too rigid, you know, that is like saying this disease will manifest itself in these ways and, and that's it. It has to transform itself to instead focus on the qualities of the disease to, to present a more, I guess, holistic, a little bit more accommodating way to look at how diseases might manifest themselves. And as such, there is then a demand for the doctor to actually listen to what the patient says, because they are kind of like the portrait of the disease. They are the the painting upon which the disease comes to life. Now, Foucault ascribes this some more technical jargon. He says that this is a transition from what he calls primary to secondary spatialization. So primary spatialization is a pure abstraction of, um, of the patient. It completely brackets off the patient in, uh, in favor of the kind of truth of the disease. Whereas in secondary spatialization, with what I've just kind of presented, what we see is a, a, a kind of slow introduction of the patient themselves into the disease. Or I'm sorry, into the encounter between the doctor and the patient, where they aren't completely bracketed off, but they aren't completely accepted as autonomous kind of individuals. Now, right, so we have, we have primary spatialization, kind of the site of disease itself, secondary spatialization, which is like the introduction of the subject in, in relation to that. And now he positions a third in relation to those first two, what he calls tertiary spatialization. Now this, in his words, are the gestures by which in a given society, a, di a disease is circumscribed, medically invested, isolated, divided up into closed uh, privileged regions or distrib distributed, sorry, throughout cure centers like hospitals. So this tertiary spatialization is a much more broad sweeping approach that kind of homogenizes care to some extent. 
and it reframes the struggle against disease as a struggle against what is considered savage or or natural which is a regrettable term but it's kind of the one we have here now in this way what we see is disease kind of relate itself organically to the mechanisms that are engaging with it so and this this makes a little bit of sense um as society grows more complex foucault says so do the diseases that plague it at least this was a uh, kind of an idea that was floating around for a while and it might be true who knows um where he says that what we see is before the advent of civilization people had the simplest most necessary diseases that is or now i should say no disease treated in a hospital is a true or even a real disease because the patient isn't taken with care so this is a kind of indifferent care one that we see uh, in the emergence of the hospital, where it was just a matter of, you know, fixing people, of, of bringing them into normalcy. So there wasn't an engagement between, you know, a single doctor and a single patient. It was like, just prescribe this this solution to all these people. There won't be an engagement between the, the patient and the doctor or the, or the nurse or, or whatever. There will just be a, just a pure prescription. Now, he contrasts this with a different kind of care, uh, that is family care, where under family care, what we see is the gentle, spontaneous care, expressive of love and a common desire for a cure, which assists nature in its struggle against the illness and allows the illness itself to attain its own truth. Now, that might seem like a strange way to put it. Why would we want the disease to attain its own truth? Well, the reason we want that is because then that would mean there's a more fluid engagement with the disease itself. There isn't just a, a, a reduction of what the disease is, like we see in like a hospital, for instance, in the, in the early forms here. So because of that, because of this kind of indifference we see in these early hospital formations, Foucault says that perhaps ironically, the hospital is then the site where the disease intensifies or it extends itself ad infinitum because it has that very potential. Whereas at home, the disease can only run its course. Now, there was also a great resistance at the time. So this is, we're talking about the mid 18th, early 18th century here to the emergence of hospitals up until, I guess, the late 18th century, because it was more expensive than just keeping people at home, right? It cost a lot of money to erect these hospitals and then to care for people in them. So there was also a kind of... Um, a reaction against the emergence of hospitals just because of the cost itself. And even this distinction that is between like family care and hospital care, uh, t it takes on a new formation even in the century that follows because like state sanctioned um, health care, it would grow to be less um, something distinct from family care and will actually try to extend family care but on a massive scale, where the hospital will kind of be seen as an extension of the, the household. Now, from there, we move into chapter two, titled A Political Consciousness. Now, as of yet, we've only been dealing with pretty minor kinds of diseases. We have yet to consider epidemics, which is highly germane for what the world is going through right now. So Foucault kind of says that epidemics are interesting because they represent something fundamentally different. That is because they are diseases that are not determined by specific qualities, but only by their qualification, that is, in the number of people affected for how long. And yet, they, and they seem to produce somewhat homogeneous effects across all people. So the approach to kind of dealing with an epidemic, as opposed to other minor diseases, became not just a manner of correcting people that were suffering from it, it became a matter of kind of tracing its development across the social body as well, where it was then seen not as an individual person being sick, but the social body itself actually being affected, that is society as a whole, being commonly affected by a similar disease, which demanded different kind of apparatuses to view it, to try to capture it, and to understand it. So there needed to then be a kind of, I guess, a supervisory uh, implementation that is something that could track trace um, watch the disease as it unfolded 
So here, you know, we'll hear the echoes of Fou some of Foucault's other famous concepts, you know, like the panopticon, you know, like surveillance, like the police, stuff like that, where we were seeing that enter into the kind of medical imaginary. And this saw the birth of what was called in France um, the, the Société Royale de Médecins, which is like the Royal Society of Doctors or Royal Society of Medicine. Now, this was a state-sanctioned approach to healthcare, And because of that, it was at odds with what was called the faculté, which was like the university authority. Because the university authority was interested, you know, primarily in developing new knowledge, new understanding of disease, whereas the state-sanctioned Société Royale de Médecins was interested primarily in kind of curbing disease, right? Kind of treating it on a mass scale, just having like the kind of umbrella-like solution to the problem of disease. Now, in this conflict, the Société had a much more... Um, had much more power because they were given, you know, state money and they had access then to other kind of national uh, information, like of other, of other nations, I should say. Uh, demographic information, the information about the spreading of disease that wasn't readily available for universities because they weren't, you know, in the government. Now, this transition that is from uh, the care of people and the, and the understanding of medicine from being an esoteric, so esoteric being a kind of... Um, locally specific uh, enterprise that is one that was reserved for those people in the academy it now became in his words an open infinite moving totality so what this did was kind of a shoe that is it got rid of a a care of the patient in his singularity and instead kind of homogenized all patients now in his in his words here this was a generalized medical consciousness diffused in space and time open and mobile linked to each individual experience and doctors became, in his words, the priests of the body. And so at the time, around the French Revolution, it was seen that medical care should be free, or doctors uh, attaining uh, medical knowledge should be for free, because it was seen as an extension of God's work, because they were kind of equated with a kind of priestliness. Now, as such, because they took on this kind of priestliness, their efforts were seen as being much more than just curing individual bodies. It became almost a matter of trying to cure civilization, where priests in like the Catholic Church are seen as people that are trying to purge the world of sin. The priests of the body, that is the doctors, were seen as trying to be um, kind of removing things that cause sin, cause sin, that cause disease, like, and I like these examples, greed, tyranny, slavery, all bad things, of course, uh, and I support it, get rid of those things. Um, but it was seen then as their responsibility to undo that, especially at the time of the French Revolution when these ideas, you know, fraternité, liberté, and um, égalité were emerging, that is fraternity, uh, liberty, and, and equality were emerging. Of course, there was a kind of broad social attempt to undo or to completely eschew tyranny and greed and, and slavery. And what this would ideally result in is a society full of healthy people. You know, if we can get rid not only of disease, but the causes of disease, then we can have a healthy civilization. Now, of course, in the proper Foucauldian way, he says that he contrasts this with the previous form of, of kind of medical care, where he says previously, what the doctor was trying to do was return the patient to a state of vigor, suppleness, and fluidity. Whereas now, now that we have this image of what a healthy body is, it becomes not a returning of someone to their fluidity, to a kind of possible humanness that is open up to alteration and change and stuff like that, to what is normal to that person. It becomes a matter of transforming the sick body into that ideal image, to what they should be, not only to make them feel right to themselves, but to make them what is right for the healthy social body. And of course, then we ask, what does this healthy body look like? Is this healthy body thin? Is this healthy body capable of certain movements? While, you know, the in inability to engage in certain things would be a marker of being unhealthy. Are people that, and so on and so forth, they really, we can really interrogate that. But here he kind of leaves us with that and then moves us here into chapter three, titled The Free Field. So this is, 
a kind of emphasis on an ideal social healthy body demanded a kind of concentrated medical gaze, which was to be the arbiter of an accurate, exhaustive, permanent uh, corpus of knowledge about the health of a population. So healthcare and the knowledge of healthcare was to be taken from the kind of darkness of the university into the spectral light of society. Now here we might hear the echoes of the idea of uh, kind of biopolitics that he comes up with in the history of sexuality, and we certainly are, because it's a matter of controlling populations. But, but yeah, anyways. Now this came about in this chapter is him just kind of outlining the few different things that motivated this. So the first one was the investment in hospital structures. So at the local level, the hospital was intended to be like the family, okay? So in that it was meant to capture the truth of the disease. So here diseases are grouped into orders, genera, and species. So this is like classificatory medicine or the nosological uh, approach. So this presents a dual gaze. That is a gaze that does not distinguish it from, but reabsorbs it into all the other social ills to be eliminated. And it is a gaze that isolates it with a view to circumscribing its natural truth. That is, it locates it within a kind of social parameter, but also tries to find out the singular truth of that disease. So however, the political and economic forces rallied against hospitals during the revolution because they were seen as a kind of institutional force of impoverishment where they would lead not only the uh, civilization, the society to be become impoverished, but like the individual people that had to be within it. Because if, you know, someone is taken away from their home to be treated in a hospital, that is one fewer person that can work, you know, assuming that their disease doesn't render them completely immobile or or incapable of engaging in work even, even verbal work or writing or whatever uh, it was seen as a hindrance to society that is hospitals work okay then uh, the second kind of thing that motivated this change was the law of medical practice and teaching so what this was was the introduction of kind of as the title suggests um, kind of established laws for how people were to attain knowledge about healthcare, and what they were to know. So this was essentially meant to temper the presence of charlatans and quacks from the medical field, right? So only legitimate people could be teaching or could be practicing medicine. Uh, and there was a kind of neoliberal approach to this because it was seen um, one of the proposed ways to do this was to open up medical knowledge to the public, to the market almost, so that only the most effective um, strategies could be accepted and could flourish. Where if someone was a quack and they were proposing things that didn't actually help, then you know people would cease going to them and then they would just run out of money and not it wouldn't be lucrative at all. So like doctors would open up their own kind of teaching practices, right? And you know if you went there and it was found to be irreputable that it was it wasn't a good institution then that institution would just with time fail. Now the, these are kind of the motivating factors into the birth of the clinic, but it's you know still a very diffuse you know um, fragmented form. Now that puts us here into chapter four titled "The Old Age of the Clinic." So we're going to see you know the kind of roots of it really here. Okay, so the prehistory of the clinic, that is, the before the clinic kind of emerged as the clinic, but, you know, the kind of foundational moments, like to lionize, it like to kind of celebrate the encounter between a doctor and a patient at the bedside as a kind of building block for the emergence of the clinic. You know, where the doctor shows up to the patient's house and sits and talks to them at the bedside and figures out what's wrong with them, prescribes things, and there is a very fluid engagement there. Now, this image of this kind of romantic encounter doesn't account for the myriad variations that that encounter would assume. And that's because there was no kind of textbook solution to any problem. If a patient were to explain a certain pain or ache or, or symptom, the doctor would then try to just figure that out, right? So they would just put on their thinking cap and try to find some solution to that problem. There wasn't, you know, the one homogenous solution and therefore it's kind of wrong for us to say that this encounter you know could be easily characterized it assumed many different forms so this kind of fluid encounter began to go away when writing and secrecy were introduced uh, and knowledge about disease 
and care could be stockpiled by a privileged group and the immediacy of the doctor and patient encounter um, gave way to a kind of doctor's prescriptions. Now, this is something we've already been kind of talking about, but now it's kind of presented more clearly. Now, this kind of portended, that is, it set the stage for the emergence of the clinic. And he g- goes here into a very kind of detailed summary of the various figures that were responsible for that, the various kind of historical movements. And I'm not going to go into that because that would take too long and it would just demand me having to read essentially the facts. But instead, I just want to kind of highlight um, what he says. So he says that the kind of first clinic that we can see or the roots of it can go back to the mid 17th, uh, 17th century, that is to 1658. And that is because as early as that time, what we saw was that it was a desire to kind of keep logs and records of individual cases. And there was a kind of value ascribed to uh, being able to learn about healthcare, being able to learn about medicine through active engagement with the sick, like in hospitals. So if there was a doctor, the doctor would bring around the pupils to the various uh, sick people in order for the, the pupil to learn about engagement with the sick. It wasn't like read this textbook and then, you know, you're going to be good to be able to heal people. So how then did these proto clinics, that is the in the what we saw in the mid 17th century, differ from what was presented in the last chapter? That is in the 18th century that took on a kind of status of hospitals that we've been talking about a bit, which are still kind of clinics, but um, it's a distinction that he makes. And how do these proto clinics differ from the bedside doctor and patient encounter. Well, here we go with another Foucauldian list. Number one, so it was somewhere in between being open to all and being specialized, that is these proto-clinics. Uh, its task was to make manifest the complete circle of diseases. It was here that a structured, uh, there was a structured nosological field, that is the emergence of a kind of classificatory medicine, where you know it was open to all in that anyone could technically come and learn there but it reserved kind of um, esoteric knowledge. It did maintain knowledge of the mysteries of the body in the form of a kind of understanding of disease that wasn't readily available to anyone just engaging with the sick, right? You had to actually sit down to some extent with a textbook to learn about these things in order to then apply them. All right, so now number two. In contrast to the hospital then, the clinic is was a space interested in the disease not the patient. So in his words, in the clinic, one is dealing with diseases that happen to be afflicting this or that patient, not the patient themselves, which is what the case, the hospital was, right? Because as we said, the hospital was trying to return the patient to an idea of normalcy. Whereas here, the, um, the clinic is concerned with the disease itself because it wants to add that disease to understand that disease and to figure out how to get rid of that disease rather than it being a matter of returning a body to normalcy. Now, the third one, third kind of difference, and this one's tricky. The clinic doesn't have an identity per se, right? Because it was, it was pretty fluid, right? It would just engage with disease as the disease presented itself. Um, and any identity it has is, is fundamentally synthetic and is subject to the alterations motivated by the particular people running it and the particular people, you know, affected within it, that is the sick people. So as such, the act of gazing over a sick body to decipher, that is not to examine it, but to decipher it, uh, it served two functions, to locate the truth of the disease, which makes sense in terms of the classificatory model, um, and, to, and to constitute the very gaze within a synthetically designated institution. Okay, so what is a synthetically des- uh, designated institution? And this isn't a word he uses, this is one I'm using. Is that it doesn't have an identity in itself. It just attains its identity through it being a site that is um, constantly adapting. It is constantly adapting to these various changes in the diseases. And it attains its identity through that. So it's always changing. That is, it's, it doesn't have a true identity. It has a synthetic one, a kind of fake plastic one, maybe, that is open to alteration, open to movement, and by virtue of that, has to always be kind of fighting to justify its existence, to justify its kind of um, fragile or volatile identity. All right, so now that's the third difference. Now the fourth difference, uh, 
um, there is a method here, right? So it shouldn't, you know, just because it's always changing doesn't mean that there's no method. It has a method. It writes things down. It logs things, but it always changes in relation to the, the diseases that are always changing. Um, and that is because these were still considered sites of learning. These kind of proto clinics were sites where people would come and learn truths about disease. So it was essentially the pupil's task to apply their nosological knowledge to a sick body. Okay, then the fifth difference, Foucault contends that it had uh, not yet developed a scientific language yet because it was too fluid, right? A scientific language is much more rigid. This is because the nosological method was always up for reevaluation and criticism by a jury of students, in his words. So this is imminent to the nosological method itself that takes the disease as nature, and therefore with its own truth that the nosological method must accommodate if there are changes. So then with all of these differences, the clinic wasn't a site for scientific knowledge yet. Scientific knowledge was still alien to it. It was essentially a place of learning and teaching that was always adapting, always changing. Now, at the end of the 18th century, this began to change, and it was opened up to the spectral light of what he calls the whole of medical experience. And that pushes us here into chapter five, the lesson of the hospitals. So if we recall from chapter two, uh, there was a conflict between the faculté, that is the university authorities, and the société, which was like the state-run kind of medical apparatus um, in terms of medicine and healthcare, right? So with growing pressures to throw out the possibility of quacks and charlatans uh, and to engage in medical practice, there was needed a concerted effort to efface through their synthesis the clinical structures based on experience and teaching and the hospital based on care and the constitution of subjects. So instead of these two things being separate now, that is these kind of proto-clinics and these, these hospitals that, had, that were different, there was then a concerted effort to kind of bridge them to introduce learning and teaching into the hospital. Well, the hospital wasn't just a site of, of healing, of returning bodies to normalcy. It became a site for teaching, like an extension of the university. So this bridging of the two, that is the introduction of teaching into the hospital, also bridged the gap between truth and speech, or, or speech and sight. So what we would see then became tied up with what we would know. So this was the introduction of the observation of patients in their beds. So whereas in the clinic, you know, you came in, talked to the doctor and, and, and went, or the doctor came to your house as a kind of proto, you know, proto, proto clinic type thing. What we have now is a big room, imagine, with all these patients, like hundreds of patients that would then be kind of administered by, you know, a few doctors and their pupils that would watch and see what was going on and then transform that into knowledge, into what could be true about the disease or the patient. So this move opened up the possibility for medicine while foreclosing it to legit illegitimate practices, right? Like charlatans or quacks or something. So naturally then this was a move away from previous knowledge that may have mistaken or may have been mistaken uh, and to essentially pave the way for an observational teaching and learning experience. So these schools, which were also hospitals, were meant to be open to the public so as to seduce would-be charlatans, right? You know, to say, look, this is like open to everyone and we can really learn the truth of, uh, of medicine and disease here and then that'll be it. Although they weren't really concerned with disease, they were just concerned with like healing, with fixing people. Uh, now this would be to enter people, not just disease, into a kind of encyclopedic entry and to make them known alongside the disease. So people then, instead of in their kind of stubborn subjectivity, like we saw in these proto-clinics when someone would tell the doctor what was, you know, the problem, now we know exactly what the constitutes the body, at least on the surface. And it is through that that we are able to then make sense of that body and to then transpose that onto other bodies to make sense of the totality of, I guess, the human bodily experience, and then put that alongside our understanding of disease. Now, of course, this wasn't totally effective at warding off charlatans and quacks, right? Because this wasn't centralized. This wasn't something that was ubiquitous. It was only happening in a few different places. So the dream of completely doing away with illegitimate approaches was, was not going to happen. 
Now, of course, the failure of this kind of motivated various polemics, various debates around what to do, where some people thought it was necessary to open up teaching to be more um, kind of more of an engagement with pupils and patients, whereas some thought that it would be better to have a more didactic approach where, you know, an experienced doctor, experienced professor would just teach people what they need to know. And of course, there was a, a desire to kind of enter it, like I've already said, into kind of a, a market system where uh, doctors, in Foucault's words here, doctor, doctors should be supervised in the same way that goldsmiths are supervised, right? So a few things came with this, another list here. Uh, they were opened up to a kind of market control, that is doctors, the teaching of pupils and so on, that could be determined by professionals and the public. Uh, the second one here, there was introduced a kind of hierarchy between doctors and officers of health that were based on a qualitative index of their uh, activity. Three, the officers of health were seen as just qualified enough to care for working country folk who were seen as less susceptible to disease, or going back to that idea that, you know, simple life results in simple disease, uh, whereas doctors were seen as higher, they could handle more complex things. And so there was this, of course, this hierarchy established. And then officers of health were given a more practical education, whereas doctors were given a more clinical one or a theoretical one. So, and, and that, you know, it makes sense. Now, all of these things were uh, kind of measures to make sure that the best kind of medical care could be extended. And, and so uh, to also ward off illegitimate forms of medical care. Now, Foucault traces this to the early movements of liberalism and placed the new, new demands on health care to care for the increasing poor population and to essentially protect the interests of the rich. And this happened a few different ways. And just before I kind of get into the specifics, um, the hospital then seems to emerge in, in my own mind here um, as a way to maintain a kind of illness, kind of societal illness because it's a place that fosters the recognition of disease that kind of uh, holds then a monopoly on disease and then probably has a pretty vested interest in the maintenance of disease because then if there is no disease then there can be no hospital and it is in the interest of the of, the, of a disease if we consider the hospital a disease to keep that alive to keep itself alive and we actually see in in, in I think Foucault is right about this, that all observation in the hospital is a kind of violence. So because it turns the body of the suffering into a spectacle that can be, um, um, you know, treated as a kind of fascinating point of, of potential knowledge that can be unearthed. So this benefits the rich because the, the poor are the ones at that time that were getting sick, right? because they were living in the, you know, these poor urban conditions in many cases that were not very sanitary at all, whereas the rich were in their high castles. And the rich could benefit because the poor were seen as kind of like guinea pigs, where they would contract all these diseases that doctors could then discover and unearth and understand so that when the rich ever did get sick, they would have a whole kind of repository, a whole uh, repertoire of understanding or of approaches to dealing with that disease. So it was in the interests of the, the rich for the hospital to exist as a site to uncover the truth of disease. All right, so we'll stop there at the end of chapter five before moving into chapter six. Uh, I hope you got something from that. Um, everyone, you know, stay safe out there. If uh, you have any questions, if I missed anything, if I was did something wrong, don't hesitate to let me know. I mean, we're quarantined. You can send me messages. I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, considering uh, consider donating if you can, or consider just, you know, surviving, having enough toilet paper for yourselves. But on that note, take care. <laughs>